Jen and Cam are two funny ladies who like to talk about murder, mass murder, murder suicide, serial killers, spree killers, thrill killers, contract killings, honor killings, and a whole lot of other shit. Too heinous for me to list here. If you're disturbed by this sort of content, you may want to listen to something else. And if you're a child trying to listen to our true crime podcast, well, you better ask your mama. <laughs> Hi, Jen. Hey, Cam. How you doing? I'm doing just fine. Well, <laughs> I don't know Spin what I was going to say there. Spin you know out. what I'm saying. Well, good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that, too. I heard you got a special case for us I, I do have. This is a little different now. If you've listened to the show for any length of time, you know that I'm kind of obsessed with the mafia, the mob, whatever mm-hmm. you, la costa nostra, whatever you want to call it. So I stumbled upon this and I yeah, the story and I... <laughs> I don't know. So a couple things before we get into this. As you may or may not know, I am not Italian. (laughs) And so many of these names, I've done the best I could to try to pronounce them. Mm -hmm. So if they're wrong, or if you know that I hit them wrong, hey, feel free to reach out and let me know. Be Um, nice, but please reach out. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, some of them are, you know, we've heard before, but some of them we haven't. This is a little bit different fare, if you will, but I I still think it's interesting because I just do. Be, that's me. Because it's the mob. Because it's the mob. Well, and, let's um, go. The Mafia, the Mob, the Family. It has many names, but there's only one thing this organization is concerned about. You know what that is, right? Money, 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 money. This long-standing group has members operating from the streets, hustling all the way up to the corporate government officials. In the neighborhoods they run, they are feared by some and adored by others. This family follows a set of rules demanding loyalty to each other above all else, including, well, your very own family. To break these laws not only goes against what they stand for, but it very well may cost you your life or two. After all, someone must pay. Dun, dun, dun. (laughs) The American mafia stems from the immigration of Sicilians and other Italians in the 1880s. Along with their luggage and families, the men brought their mother country's mafia code with them to the East Coast, along with uh, a few other parts of the country. When prohibition started, the mafia saw a cash cow and Mm -hmm. acted accordingly. Members would sell illegal liquor to the speakeasies. They dominated the scene and made sure that they had a hand in it all. They were probably a savior to most people. That, there was That's why I said they were mm-hmm. feared and adored. Some of the, you know, poorer areas, they, they were known to give out great Christmas presents and gifts and things like that to people that maybe couldn't afford it. The good and the bad. There you go. It was during this time that the five families were fighting for control in New York City. Charles, Lucky Luciano, as you probably know him, was the first boss of the Genovese family, and he had an idea. He wanted the mafia families to agree to share power and approve activities for the entire country. Hmm. Sharing's hard, though. Okay. It is. So here is where the commission was born. The commission was established in 1931 and was initially run by Salvatore Maranzano, who gave himself the title boss of all bosses. That didn't set well with Lucky, so he orchestrated Maranzano's assassination. Mm -hmm. The new commission was made up from bosses from the five New York families, along with Al Capone from Chicago and Stefano Megadino of the Buffalo family. The five families are the Gambinos, Lucchese, Genovese, Colombo, and Bonanno. Nice. St. Louis had a, uh, We. I was going to say that we were actually pretty big in the mafia. We were yeah. with the Chicago outfit there for a while. I think we branched out for a bit too, didn't we? Not we, us personally, but the St. Louis branch. The, this, and then they really Kansas wanted, City branch. Yeah. yeah, they really wanted this organization to run the whole country, basically. Right. I mean, they, mm-hmm. they would report there. Much like a big corporation, the commission... Kind of like the I- Ironworker Union, right? <laughs> yeah, The exactly. mob union. 
Much like a big corporation, the commission runs like a a board of officers. The members acted as representatives for other families too, bringing their concerns to the attention of the rest of the commission. The money-making schemes, as well as the assassination attempts, all had to go in front of the commission to be approved. Now, there's a set of rules, and I thought this was interesting. So, Mm -hmm. of course, I'm going to share them because, I don't know, I just think it's interesting. And these are verbatim from their code. So there's a set of rules. They obviously have to be obeyed and failure to do so. Well, Jen, it's the mafia. You going to break that rule? I don't think so. You don't get a slap on the wrist, I believe. Yep. Number one, no one can present himself directly to another of our friends. There must be a third party to do it. Okay. A witness. (laughs) Can I get a witness? Basically, it's so that you have to have somebody to vouch. So say if, if I'm in there... I'm going to vouch for you that you're not a rat. You're not an FBI guy, right? Mm-hmm. So you can't. So you, if you want it in, you can't go straight to the guy to talk to him. That would be frowned upon. Number two, never look at the wives of friends. Which should go without saying, but okay. Three, never be seen with cops. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Probably Makes really sense good. Too. Four, don't go to pubs and clubs. Five, I love this because this is, you can't make this up. Always be available for Costa Nostra. It's a duty, even if your wife's about to give birth. Six, appointments must absolutely be respected. You can never be late. That's a big thing. That's just common sense. You know, it nice. is, but like pe- some people are late and they're notoriously late and you always mm-hmm. know that. Seven, wives must be treated with respect. Eight, when asked for any information, the answer must be the truth. Nine, money cannot be appropriated if it belongs to others or to others' families. Others meaning in the mob, I'm assuming. I I would say. In the club. Yes. Yeah. Because I would think that they. If you were running a club. Yeah. Because, you know, they take take a cut of everything, basically, in the neighborhood. And then number 10, people who can't be a part of Costa Nostra, anyone who has a close relative in the police. Anyone with a two-timing relative in the family, the wording here, anyone who behaves badly and doesn't hold to moral values. It just kind of cracks me up. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Just the wording. The moral values and then they kill people. Yeah. Yeah. It's their code. It is their code. With these rules, there were some other unspoken rules. And these I find interesting. No facial hair. I never thought about that, but it's kind of true. You never see a monster. Mm Mm-hmm. I think that was kind of the style in the 30s anyway. But it's now. This is like from all all the way. So it still holds true. I'm going to guess probably not so much with the youngins, but you know. Okay. No blood for blood, meaning you can't kill someone just because they killed your family. Unless, of course, it was approved by the boss. And all must be Italian to become full or made members. And that's why that was a big deal with uh, Donnie Brasco, because he wasn't Italian. Mm -hmm. You know, and he made that in there. There was also a whispering that all men must, must like the ladies. But we're going to get to ah. that in a little bit after some more background. And that's where this story, that's what this story is about. The Big Five ran New York City, but there was another family that ran New Jersey. The Big Five, of course, as I mentioned before, were the Gambinos, Genovese, Lucchese, Colombo, and Bonanno. And the family responsible for handling the affairs in nearby Jersey, Jersey, was the Di Cavalcante family. Now, this also happens to be the rumored family that one of my very favorite shows of all time is based on. And you know what show that is, with the lead being the person that you love. Oh, yeah. It's Sopranos. I mean, the Sopranos. I, very few would argue with you there. Yeah. The Jersey organization started with Sam de Cavalcante, known as Sam the Plumber, or <laughs> the Count. Now, and let me just say, I love the mafia, and I know I've said this because I distinctly remembering on one of our previous episodes that I think you and I should have names, like I just Sam the Plumber. During his reign, he doubled the number of made men within the family during the 1960s. He gained his nickname from the HVAC company he owned and ran, which, of course, was how he hid his illegal money. You got to have your front, right? Your front, your business front to hide Mm -hmm. the money. He also claimed to come from a royal Italian family, hence his other nickname, the Count. 
It was a big deal because he ended up with a seat on the infamous commission next to the big five. He was the one representing the the Jersey family, the state of New Jersey. Now, when Sam, or Sam the plumber, as I like to call him, did a prison stint, and he was a little bit older, he appointed a man by the name of Giovanni John the Eagle Raji as acting boss of the family. Now, Raji was tight with the Teflon Don, John Gotti, Mm -hmm. And during the 1980s, that Raji fell increasingly under the influence of the Gambino crime family boss, John Gotti. When Raji's conviction for racketeering happened, he appointed John D'Amato as acting boss of the family in 1990. And here is where our story begins, Jen. When John Johnny Boy, that's his name, when John Johnny Boy D'Amato took over, he continued to do what he did best, murder. He was a tried and true gangster, just like John Gotti. Both men were a bit flashy and both knew what it took to get to the top and remain at the top. Johnny Boy was not very well liked in the outfit. He was a hothead and he did what he wanted. He, he didn't really listen to anyone. When Johnny Boy disappeared one chilly day in January of 1992, people wondered if he went with Luca Brazzi and was now sleeping with the fishes. You know where that's from. I do. It's Godfather. Elizabeth and its twin city, Newark, located in northern New Jersey, has long been a town with a rough side. With its roots as an industrial city, the scenery is a bit bleak, with refineries spitting smoke into the air. And if you remember the um, intro to The Sopranos, and they're driving through the very industrial-like, that's Elizabeth and Newark in that area, the opening for the show. In the Petersburg area, you will find one of the oldest Italian-American communities. Just like the Sopranos, their streets are lined with Italian meat markets and Italian bakeries. Johnny Boy might not have been well-liked, but with a friend like John Gotti, few would speak up. Like they say, it's better to be feared than respected. Am I right? Mm -hmm. When Johnny Boy was at the top, he made sure to secure his leadership with great power below him. You know, we're only as good as the people below us, right? That's true. The workers. Johnny's childhood friend, Anthony Capo, was a soldier for the family who did the work. And that's in quotes for the family. He did what you call, and this was interesting to me. I don't know. I'm just intrigued. He did what is called the wet work. You want to take a guess at what that work? Wet. You want to take a guess at what that means? Cleaning up wet stuff. I don't know. Close. Mm-hmm. It's uh, he killed those that crossed the family. So oh, wet okay. meaning like you know you get a little dirty. I'm get guessing a little that's how wet from little. the blood spatter. Mm-hmm. Anthony would not only use a gun or a knife, but he would use whatever weapon was closest by, such as a fork. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you heard me right. A fork, like an eating utensil fork. Mm-hmm. As the story goes, one evening when he was chatting up a lady friend who was at a at the bar, a man approaches and starts hitting on the lady right in front of him. Mm, that's not that's good. Not, nah, nah, yeah. That's not, that's, not for that man. It's not, that's yeah. the one you want to hit on in front of him. Anthony tells him to get lost, and the man snaps off using some choice words, right? Who are you to make fun of him? What, tell me whatever, whatever they would say. Anthony picks up a fork and shoves it in the man's eye. Mm-hmm. Anthony was cruel and cold and willing to do whatever was needed. Nobody will ever look at a fork that way again. <sighs> Ooh, could you... Uh, you're hit, hitting on, but I'm sure he was disrespectful to the lady, but I don't think it warrants a fork in the eye. Another man under Johnny was mm-hmm. Stefano Vitabli. Stefano was old school. He had been in the family for a long time, and he'd seen his share of what's going on. He never wanted to be a boss. He was content to be the man that was sought for when they needed advice. He was in control of what went down and how to do it. So he didn't want to be the guy on top. He just kind of wanted to be the guy on top's number two, Mm -hmm. if you will. It's probably the safest position, I would think. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's the consigliari, but we'll get to that. The biggest feather in Johnny's fedora was a man by the name of Vinny Palermo, who went by Vinny Ocean, which (laughs) Vinny Ocean, I thought that was cool, due to his day job at a seafood market called Fulton fish market. Now, Vinny was a good-looking guy with manners and charisma who slung fish by day and slung wiggles at night. Wiggles is a strip club, and mm, Vinny, mm-hmm. Vinny owned it and operated it. And by the way, in The Sopranos, uh, the Bada Bing was based on wiggles. Nice. 
As if he's not busy enough, he also masterminded a scheme just like the wolf of Wall Street, Jordan Belfort, did. The old pump and dump, which is having people buy stock fast, quick, easily, small amount of time, makes the price go skyrocket high. Mm -hmm. And then when it's high, you dump it. Those with a lot of stock earn a killing off this. Right. It's also illegal, by the way. Highly illegal. Yeah. With these four running the New Jersey show, they are doing just fine in business. In their personal lives, they were doing what most of the main men were doing. They have a lovely wife at home who's raising beautiful children. But that's where they lived their life that everybody saw them live. Now, when the men went out on the town, that's a different story. They would all have a girlfriend or several girlfriends, if you will. And Johnny Boy was no different. Enter a woman by the name of Kelly, or that's what she went by in court, by the way. Mm -hmm. Kelly, not her real name. Kelly said that Johnny Boy approached her at a bar one night and ever so confidently said, here's the place, and if you're interested in me, you'll be there. No need to exchange numbers, which I thought was pretty, that's pretty bold. I kind of like it. What year is this, by the way? It is in the 90s. It's in the the 90s. 90s. Okay. Yeah. Of course, 20-year-old Kelly was curious, and she showed up, which I got to tell you, I think most people would. If somebody approached you, and they're older, and they're just that, or maybe that's just me, I'd be nosy to find out what, what this was about. And that's what leads you into trouble. It does. But from there, the relationship grew. Johnny Boy spoiled her, but there's always a price to pay. Kelly would have to be available for Johnny whenever he mm-hmm. wanted And she would also have to do whatever he wanted and when he wanted it. Now, see, that I would have a problem with. (laughs) I'd have a little problem with that. Can't have both ways. Can't, I guess. At this time, Johnny Boy was living high with a young beauty on his arm and an endless amount of money. He was wheeling and dealing at casinos all around. He likes to be noticed. And all that attention, yeah, that was not lost on the FBI. They began to follow him and videotape him. Johnny was convinced that his car was bugged, and he made sure those that were in the car with him were silent. His paranoia was ramped up when his mentor, John Gotti, was arrested. When Johnny went to Kelly's apartment in October of 1992, he was panicking, saying the FBI had him on tape, and he was leaving town. When he left Kelly's apartment, he was never seen again. Do you think he was a little bit paranoid just because, or do you think there was a little? Oh, we're gonna get to that. No, it's chemical a mafia dependent no, type thing. No, I think okay. uh, I don't. I, that's why, like every time, if I was in the mafia, every time they'd say, "Hey, let's go for a ride," I'd be like, "No thanks, no, no thanks. I'm good. I'm good. I'll hey, take let's, a uh, I'm gonna I call need you an to Uber. Meet, meet me here. Nope, <laughs> yeah. I'm good. Take my own car. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I just wondered so, what led to that. All the paranoia. Was it his own conscience, or are you going to tell us? Well, there's a couple little things, and we'll get to this. And I'm okay. sure, like you and I are, you and I are besties, have been forever. And if you started acting a little bit funny, I think I would notice right away. And I yeah. think you would think the same of me. And I'm, I'm guessing that's kind of what happened. So here we go. What happened to old Johnny Boy? Now, at first, associates just thought he was hiding out from the FBI, but after a year passes, people start to think, hmm, I smell a rat. Mm. See what I did there? I do. Mafia, get it? With the boss out, someone needed to lead, and that role went to Vinny Ocean. Vinny would now run the DiCavalcante family. Vinny would take his new position and run with it, earning more and more money with all the things that made money. Schemes. Big schemes. All was going great for the family until one of the low-level soldiers got caught up in a scheme And this led him to commit the biggest mistake for a family member. Hmm. You know what that is, right? (laughs) Right? What is it? Uh, To rat on somebody. There you go. To become a rat. To save his own behind, he agreed to wear a wire for the FBI. I gotta be, I don't even know what would be more scary if you have the FBI saying, here's the deal, or you have the, (laughs) your, you know, associates that you, you're... Then you have to uh, rely on the FBI to keep you safe. Yeah, like you're... And go you're into witness protection. Mm-hmm. Yeah. With all so the maybe evidence... maybe just stay out of the mafia. God. But hindsight, you know, that whole 20 You know what, though? They grow up. It's, you know... With all the evidence this wiretap provided in the fall of 2000, the indictment started flying. 
In all, the FBI arrested nearly 40 members, 40, including Johnny Boy's top three boss, Vinnie Ocean, Stefano Vitabli, and Anthony Capo. Could Johnny Boy be the rat that helped the FBI net basically the entire family? Hmm, That's what they're thinking, by the way. The family's thinking? Yeah. Yes. Yes. With all these men behind bars, the prosecutors needed testimony. They needed them to squeal on each other, but we all know that's not likely since that goes against the code. Then again, I guess they made them an offer they couldn't refuse. I see. (laughs) I hear. Yes. You hate me. I know. (laughs) Hitman Anthony Capo would sing like a canary telling all their secrets from murders to schemes. He told them all they ever wanted, as well as things they didn't even know about. He was only the first one. Most of the underlings fell in line and folded like a cheap Italian suit. So are, you, are you waiting for pa- <laughs> laughs? Mm-hmm. Yeah. laughter? Okay. <laughs> yeah. To many surprise, Vinny Ocean caved too. And that was a shocker because it, that was just not like him. Only the old schooler Stefano and the two little soldiers stayed true to the oath and would refuse to rat on everything that was going on. On April 21st, 2003, the trial against the three remaining made men began. While they faced charges ranging from loan sharking and racketeering to murder, it was one murder in particular that would shock the courtroom. Of course, there would be plenty of murders that could be attributed to the De Cavalcante crime family, but one had all ears listening. Former mob boss Johnny, Johnny Boy D'Amato. And here's where we find out what happened. It was his childhood bestie, hitman Anthony Capo, who told the tale on the stand. Capo relays a story that had many raising their eyebrows, shall we say? Seems that mob men shared more than just illegal cash scams, like Kelly. Kelly. Ooh, Kelly. Mm, Kelly. Kelly, who was Johnny Boy's sweetie, was also dating another made man. None other than his best friend, Anthony Ooh. Capo. One night back in 1991, Kelly told Anthony that Johnny had a kink, and that was sex. Well, sex, mm, how shall we say, in groups with other women Uh and men. Seems that the couple regularly visited after our sex clubs where they participated in some fun. However, one night, Kelly lost Johnny in the club, and when she went looking for him, she got an eyeful. Johnny and his new friend were, shall we say, caught with their pants down? A little bit, yeah. I had said playing the skin flute, a little bit of Peter piping, if you will. You understand. You get the reference. You know what Mm -hmm. Johnny and and his friend were doing. Anthony would testify on the stand to this. As I stated earlier, one cannot simply take out a made man without permission from the commission. As they talked, Anthony Capo and his crew decided that it was too embarrassing to actually tell the commission that Johnny Boy was actually dipping his <clears throat> toe in the other world, a world that the macho mafioso men would never approve of. So they needed to keep this under wraps, just as they needed to make, keep it a family affair, if you right. will. So Sigliari Stefano 
signed off on the hit, and just like he did best, Anthony Capo would do the wet work. As is typical for mob hits, often those closest to the hit, meaning closest friend, bestie, you know, acquaintance, whatever you want to do, is the one to actually make the hit. And at first I thought that was weird. And then I was like, no, it's not. Because if you're... you trust. Yes, exactly. If you're untrusting of several, the one you won't be untrusting The one that you would be more apt to go with would be the one that you're closest to. Yep, I get it. But then you wouldn't want to be close to anybody, right? Mm Mm-mm. Yeah. But a lot of these guys, you know, they follow in this at age, you know, 11, 12, 13. Yeah. Anthony would testify that on that October day, he went to Johnny's house and picked him up under the guise of going to Brooklyn to check on some business dealings. As they arrive, Anthony Capo simply turns around and shoots Johnny Boy in the head. And this is what he had testified on the stand. Quote, nobody's going to respect us if we have a gay homosexual boss sitting down discussing La Costa Nostra business. And that's what he testified to on, or that's, that's what heartbreaking. he said that is... on the stand in 2003. Up next on the stand is Vinny Ocean, who confirmed the story that Anthony just unveiled to the courtroom. He said it was, in fact, Stefano that ordered the murder of Johnny Boy D'Amato. The jury began to deliberate in early June 2003. On June 4th, the jury was back with the verdict against Stefano and his two soldiers. Stefano was convicted on the count of murder for the death of Johnny, Johnny Boy D'Amato. Stefano, along with his two underlings, were all sentenced to life in prison. The three of them remained true to the mafia code and sank with the ship, never ratting out the others. The Di Cavalcante crew was down, but not out, although the New York families would end up running many of the businesses previously run by the family over in New Jersey. In 2015, 10 members of the crime family were taken in by the FBI on charges of conspiracy to commit murder and distribution of drugs. Now, this included the captain, Charles Beeps Stango, and his consigliari, Frank Nigro. In March, this is what they're up to currently, is what I'm telling you. In March 2017, Stango was sentenced to 10 years in federal prison for conspiracy to commit murder. The claim is that Stango reportedly wanted to get permission from the New Jersey hierarchy to kill Luigi Oliveri, but thankfully for Luigi, the murder was not committed because he never, Stango is the he, never did get an answer from the commission to make that happen. Charles Big Ears Majari is the current boss of the family. He started his reign, I guess, in 2015 and is currently the boss of the DiCavalcante family over in Jersey. Here's some interesting footnotes for you. So there's a lawyer, and he's a, he's a pretty big, big, big-time lawyer, and his name is Roy Cohn. Oh, yeah. Now, Roy represented a lot of big mafia dons, like yep. Anthony Salerno and mm-hmm. Carmine Galante, and he was, shall we say, quite a personality, and that's to say <laughs> the least. He had his, uh, being let's nice. say, he, yeah. he, he dabbled in a lot of things. I mean, he really was. And like the list, I mean, he has ties from to Trump all the way back to Joseph McCarthy yep. from the Red Scare, the communist you know, yep. witch hunt, I guess he went on. There's a documentary that came out like three, four years well, ago, I guess think. guess what? That's what yeah. I bring up here in a minute. Oh, so here okay. we go. Mm-hmm. The, one of the things he did, which I thought was kind of terrible, but for a couple of reasons, several reasons, actually. but. He was friends with Joseph McCarthy, and the two of them would establish this thing called the Lavender Scare, which targeted government officials and cultural figures, not only for their communist sympathies, but also for alleged homosexuality. That's quote. McCarthy and Cohn were responsible for the firing scores of gay men from government employment and strong armed many opponents into silence using rumors of their sexuality. Could you imagine being fired for your sexuality today? Yeah, it's ridiculous. I, but also rumored. Like you, right. No, I just know. Saying it's that. ridiculous. But there's just one the little thing. Of of, one little thing about Roy makes this all that much more shocking. He was gay. He was mm-hmm. gay. Mm-hmm. He was closeted, but he was gay. But he made sure to keep that quiet. There's a of great documentary called Bully, Coward, Victim, the story of Roy Cohn. And I recommend it. I, it came out in 2019, I believe. It shot. I mean, he just, he knew a lot of people. There's a lot to talk about a life lived. 
Right. Whether it be good or bad, there's lots going on there. There's another one that I was thinking about called Where's My Roy Cohn? Yep. Mm-hmm. I didn't see that when I saw this one. Although you couldn't be gay and be in the mob, the mob, which again, because it makes money, the mob operated a lot of gay bars and nightclubs, including the famous and infamous Stonewall Inn. I thought that was intriguing. Mm-hmm. The storyline of Johnny Boy was featured in a soprano storyline. The character was named Vito. And he was killed after two of his fellow gangsters saw him at a gay bar. The Sopranos TV show is the only TV show that I've watched three times from front to back. Really? Every episode. It's the only one. Hmm. I love it. I think it's just I can't watch wouldn't. things over and over. Doesn't hold I love my interest. It. Mm-mm. And finally, Jen, here's the good news. Just in time for Pride Month, and it makes my heart happy. Pride Week here in St. Louis, by the way. Yes, it is. The Mafia have actually relaxed their rules to allow gay members because one of Italy's own godfathers, his own son, is a drag queen named Ah. Lady Godiva. Makes my heart happy. Awesome. Quote, uh, the prosecutor that goes against a lot of these Italian. um, Now, this is over overseas, but I hope that that applies here, too. Uh, One of the prosecutors that goes after a lot of the Italian Mafia men over there. He was quoted as saying, quote, gays can be accepted now, even as foot soldiers, as long as they don't parade it in public, end quote. At least it shocks me that the mafia can move along. The mafia that is, you know, the mafia and not the rest of the world. But that's OK. Johnny Boy's body has never been found. It's so a couple things either. A cu- couple things just to add while I'm thinking about it. So Kelly, when she started dating Capo, Anthony, Johnny Boy's bestie. She would also say that he, I mean, I'm guessing a lot of these, I don't know for a fact. I guess one of the unspoken rules is that the men had to treat their wives very well, but you didn't necessarily have to treat your girlfriend as well. Right. Or Gumara, what they call it over there, or in Italian, I believe. So she would, she had told Anthony that, you know, sometimes Johnny Boy was really brutal. And he was also brutal with her in the bedroom, forcing her to do things. There's a story that he, um, they went to a bar and he's like, he, he called the waitress over, you two are going to have sex and I'm going to watch. And both of them are like, no, we're not. And he's like, yes, you are. You will. And so uh, they did because he, I guess the, uh, he was fallout. who he was. Yeah. Nope. So let's see what else. Started. I, I did think it was interesting. So if anybody's in the mafia and listening to this, <laughs> don't come after me. I just, you know, I'm just saying, because I that occurred to me. I was like, I, I, what if I told some secrets? Maybe you can be a girlfriend. Maybe you can no. be a mobster's girlfriend. No, that's all I need. No, thank you. I will take the gifts, though. Oh, yeah. I just... Uh, you got to work for those gifts. <sighs> what else do I have to do except write the podcast and record with you? I'm, a, I'm okay. I can do that. So I think, and if you watch The Sopranos, there's lots of things that go very similar to, to this. And a funny little side note, but I don't think... I don't know if this would be copyrighted, but they have some undercover wiretaps of the family talking about The Sopranos and that they liked it. And they're like, of course you know, they did. so I was thinking about how I could get that to play it because I think it's kind of funny. But if you watch The Sopranos, they do that. They kind of, yeah. there's a lot of stuff in there that they kind of. That it, the writers added because b- of. Based. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. One of the characters, uh, as anybody knows, if you haven't seen those Sopranos, Tony goes to a therapist and he is on Prozac. I think it was Sammy the Bull Gravano, maybe. I can't remember if that's right. One of one of the big mobsters went to a therapist for a very short amount of time. And the therapist is like, you have to get out. You have to get out of that life. And he's like, no, thank you. And he exited and that was it. In reality, if a, a made man went to a therapist, not only would he die, the therapist would probably be killed oh, as well. Yeah. Because I would think so. The secrets that they might secrets. be able to know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they're like that. You know, that part's not... Um, like I said, I'm I'm obsessed. I always have been. I mm-hmm. every time I just soak it all up. I I just think it's interesting that it's like you know it's a street gang, but they have day jobs. Sort of. Does that make sense? It's just a weird kind of yeah. Well, how just like evolved. Tony. Tony had mm-hmm. yeah his waste management company. So yeah, and they you know Vinny had his fish. Uh, mm-hmm. Sammy Sam the plumber had his HVAC system. They all have like legit stuff, but you know. So um, I don't know if this is really our kind of our audience for this, but I just I oh it's interesting yeah I think it is uh, one of my Richard 
you know, Richard Iceman, who I can't say his last name, Kublonsky. You know who I'm talking about, right? Yes, yes. you do. I don't, yeah. can't pronounce his name. Would yeah. be able to, but Kublinsky. Anywho, like how he killed people, he would like walk by and like blow poison him and knock him out that way. I was like, what? And then he'd put him on ice because then it'd throw off the time of death. So he'd freeze him, keep him for a long time, and then toss him out. So it'd be like they were just found. Oh, look, they just died. Where were they for the last eight months? Well, they were dead in a freezer for eight months. But to the authorities, it looks like he, well, this person must have just been killed, you know, two days ago. Wrong. So that is the story of Johnny Boy D'Amato. It's, uh, and there's so there's so much more to this and that not not just his thing, but just the stories of it. Well, you know, honestly, he so he 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 liked he liked men. both sexes. Yes, yes, I, right, yes, yes. Right. That's a shame that out of everything that happened to him, that's what got him taken. Or out. he preferred men, but you can't you can't in the mob at that point. You you couldn't. So you he had a girlfriend, but he'd also you know right enjoy, enjoyed men. I guess. Very interesting. I liked the whole Sopranos tie-in, too. That was pretty nice. Oh, there's, I'm trying to think of some other... Like, it's so much stuff in there that's... Well, I always loved Tony Soprano. And I, I know you did. It's... That's the kind of... Uh, that fury that he has. I don't know. It's the same way yeah. with Doctor Who. That they're like these bumbling, fun guys, and then all of a sudden, this wrath comes out. I know that sounds really horrible when it's said out loud. But there's just something about it that... Well, they have charisma. Right. As the character. That's but that, I'm guessing that's how, you know, that... I don't know. I just would... I would love to sit down with a person. A gangster was, or mm-hmm. mobster? Oh, I have so many questions. I have to tell you, I do like... And it's the romanticism of the whole thing. The 1930s mobsters rather mm-hmm. than the new mm-hmm. the new wave type mobs. Yep. mobs. Yep. And the whole commission <laughs> thing where I, I think... I mean, what is it like? It's sort of a club with no rules, but then they have so- a few rules. They have commandments. Everything but, reminds me to, of like the Ten yeah, Commandments. You have it's to follow it. So Catholicism. You and I are in the, you know, the Cam Jin family, and I want to kill you. So I go to the commission, and every one of them have to sign off on that before you can die. And so, if, you know, somebody from the New York borough doesn't, one of the boroughs doesn't want me to do it, then I can't do it. And they abide by that. Mm-hmm. Interesting, I think. And so, so you get a rogue person that just Well, that's what care. that's what they did with yeah. Johnny Boy, right? They couldn't uh-huh. admit that because he was tight with Gotti and everything else. So there you go. All right, Very Jen, nice. what else? I finished Candy. I actually I sat see. down and watched that. So good, isn't it? It is. So let's talk about this. And if you haven't seen Candy, you can skip through this. Do you think it happened the way she said it happened? No, not at all. <laughs> oh. I don't either. No. I'm very, um, I'm so nosy. I, I really wish we could figure out what happened. What do you know? Here's a little tidbit for you, which I think is interesting when they find this. A movie is coming out. A big screen movie is mm-hmm. coming out with that. Did you know Elizabeth that? Elizabeth Olsen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Playing. Yep. So yep. I think that's, it's like that, that story happened so long ago and it's like somebody got a hold of that and then, do you see what I'm saying? It's yeah, almost it like in 1980s. Cheating on a test. Like that story's been around for a while and then Jessica well, Biel produced it and and rushed it out but then also the same year elizabeth olsen's gonna do a movie about it like the story's been around for a while do you see what i'm saying right well i was very happy watching it because i don't look into things before i watch it i just knew that it was jessica biel and then you know you see her husband in it and then all of a sudden one of my favorite people pop i hear a voice and i look up and it's jason ritter I was yeah. so excited to see Did Jason you know Ritter. he's married to her? I did. I just recently ju- found that out. Justin yeah, is married to Michelle Jessica. Li- uh, Lys- Linsky? Is that oh, her name? Michelle Linsky? I did, I did my names today. I can't do anymore. <laughs> well, that's who I'm thinking. It, that's yeah. what I think her name is. But yeah, I love her too. I think she's great. So the documentary so. on Hulu that I watched mm-hmm. this morning is called Leave No Trace. And it is about the Boy Scout, uh, sex scandal Boy Scout. Jen, when I say truly shocked how many boys have been Mm -hmm. molested and groomed and abused and raped since 1910 and they knew about it, I don't even know what to say. When they started to investigate, they thought that they'd have maybe, you know, seven to 10,000 people come forward, which Mm -hmm. is shocking. 82,000 men came forward. Mm 82,000. No, I know. 
And they it's, they kept files on people, but they did not check it out. It's on Hulu. It's phew, something. Uh, did you watch the Keep Sweet with Warren what? Jeffs? The Keep yeah. Sweet with the Warren Jeffs oh, and the FLDS. It's, yes, it's disgusting too. Uh-huh. <laughs> God, I know. I know. And he just like his voice and how <laughs> everything oh. about him makes me want to hit something. So dis- and like they look at him as a leader, and people still do. I know. Ah, oh, and Keep Sweet. Come on. I know. I know. All right. I'm done with them getting fired up. All yeah, right, but Jen. those are the only two. I mean, I rarely watch TV. And yeah, I, me it was too. A sweet, <laughs> it was a sweet treat to be able to watch those. Watch the not Leave No Trace. To watch Candy. It's and, short. Uh, well, sweet. it's like two hours long. I what is it called again? Leave No Trace, because Leave that's no exactly what they did. They, they kind of hit it and covered it up. And yeah. Well, you know, the Southern Baptists just recently released a list of they keep names too yeah it's over 700 pages long i'm not a scammer or shyster but it i don't understand and believe me i'm happy they did but why do they keep files like that if you're not going to turn it into the police what are you doing what are you doing and that's the boy scouts and the baptist i guess and the catholics like catholic church you know what i mean like they they keep files on these people but Mm -hmm. why because if you're not going to report them the Boy know. Scouts did it because they said this was their no volunteer list is what it was. But it was like it was almost like a resume filled out seriously. So it'd have a color of their eyes, wears glasses, beards, all the, And it was so that when they got fired from, like, say, St. Louis, Missouri, they couldn't go to Chicago and be a scoutmaster because right. then they could look in that file. But again, if you knowingly let somebody it's just shocking. It's shocking. Oh, I, don't. I know. I know. All those people that have been hurt, it kills me. And it's just infuriating. Drug abuse, alcohol abuse, uh, mm-hmm. suicide, like all of that due to, I mean, that's just, you know. Due to people that you trust. Mm-hmm. It's that terrible. That betray you. All right. Yep, it off. is. All right. I'll get off my soapbox. I'll, uh, <laughs> until next time, Jen, remember, lock your doors. Keep passing by those open windows. Uh, bye-bye. Love you. Today's episode was researched and written by me, Cam. For more information about this episode, as well as all the sources I used, please check out our show notes or the podcast website at ourtruecrimepodcast.com. Our True Crime Podcast is developed and created by hosts Jen and Cam. Original music and audio mix of all our True Crime Podcast episodes is courtesy of Nico Vertese from We Talk of Dreams. Listener discretion is provided by Edward October from October Pod VHS. Our True Crime Podcast is executive produced by Nico Vertese and Dick Bain. Make sure to like and subscribe to Our True Crime Podcast wherever you listen to your podcast. We can be reached on Instagram and Facebook at Our True Crime Podcast or on Twitter at Our True Crime Pod. You can email us at Our True Crime Podcast at gmail.com. If you really like the show, make sure to check out our Patreon at Our True Crime Podcast. Our True Crime Podcast is an OTC production. Mm-hmm.